I'd like to welcome everyone this evening. Um, my name is Sarah Hallett. I am the director of the Meta Foundation and I also run August House, which is a studio space in Johannesburg in Dornfontein. Um, this panel discussion is the first panel discussion um, of four, which will be taking place uh, tomorrow. There's another one. And next week, there are a further two. You're more than welcome to look at our Facebook page for their details. And all of these conversations fall under a larger project we are running, which is uh, responding to this um, sentence. The problem with contemporary African art is dot, 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 question mark. The project uh, is looking to kind of reveal the statement as being flawed and inaccurate and reposition the problem by reframing it as one that comes from continental history of colonialism. We really want to try and reflect on our position as Africans and as South Africans within the global context and look at why it is that for so many years the continent and us as practitioners have been left out of some of these serious debates around this concept of African art. And um, over the process of this project, we hope to unpick what African art means, what it means to be an African. Is it a geographical question? Is it a racial question? Is it a stylistic question? Um, we don't really see there being any kind of right and wrong. We <coughs> I think this project um, is hopefully going to open up quite a lot of debate and try and reflect many multiple viewpoints um, across its time running. The project will roll itself out in three kind of main areas. Uh, this is the first of that. So we've got some panel discussions. Out of the panel discussions, there will be a series of essays written, which will be turned into a publication. Then there is a print project where we have paired um, sort of younger artists with more established artists and they will be asked to respond to this statement and produce work which will be exhibited. And then lastly, to kind of bridge the gap between these two very visual and, and you know, maybe the more academic side, we have a zine where we partnered with Alphabet Zoo to create also something responding to the statement, but kind of reflecting back on the publication, the essays and the work. So with that, I am going to hand over to Nkhopeleng Malloy. She will be our host for this evening and moderate this conversation. I'm going to hang back in the background and just be here if there are any technical um, glitches. And I'm going to leave it up to you Nkhopeleng to introduce uh, both the topic and our pan panelists, excuse me. Um, but before we go, I'd like to very much say thank you to yourself for coming on board and organizing this and coming up with this topic, which I think you will see is very interesting. And as, as Ashraf mentioned er earlier on everyone's lips at the moment, um, and to our panelists for joining us this evening and giving of their time to add to this um, debate. The last thing I have to say is that this project is a National Arts Council funded project. So we would like to thank them for their support in allowing us to have this debate and make this happen. And over to you, Nkhopeleng. Cool, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, so I thought that I would start with some reflections and thoughts, um, and then I'll introduce Ashraf and Vusi. And then I'll give them a set of provoca uh, provocations to think through. Um, and then once that conversation gets going, uh, we can allow the audience to come in and ask questions um, or kind of reflect on, on, on the night. So I guess for me, at the best of times, my relationship with art and art making practices is very hopeful. I believe in the power of the image, that it matters and that it contributes something to this long journey that we find ourselves in. And that is the project of being human. In a collection of essays written during lockdown, Zadie Smith speaks about the idea of art as quote unquote, something to do. She proposes that writing, drawing, painting or whatever is simply something to do, something that is charming, but ultimately not useful beyond providing some level of pleasure compared to having actual political efficacy. 
um, Zadie notes that it's a delusional painter who finishes a canvas at two o'clock and expects radical societal transformation by 4 p.m. So basically she's kind of echoing this idea that artists mimic and echo the agency of um, kind of activists as opposed to actually doing the work. And so the reason why I brought this on um, is to kind of think of these two binaries between the usefulness of art versus kind of as something that is pleasurable. And I think this topic that is um, brought forward today is particularly important to me because on good days, I kind of feel that the image does matter and how we treat it and what we do with it is crucial. And then on the worst of days, I just kind of think that it's all just something to do. So that will be quite interesting to see how our panelists um, think through these binaries. I see that Vusi has joined us, but unfortunately Ashraf has left, maybe it's connection issues. So I'll start by introducing Vusi um, and then we can kind of see what happens. So Vusi is a writer, an educator, musician, uh, and a cult cultural practitioner, but he's also a political organizer interested in the ways in which black people materially and culturally resist rapture in everyday forms of resist and rapture everyday forms of anti-blackness. He's interested in the radical potentialities of black Afro-diasporic musics, cinema, contemporary art, as well as critical race meta theory, quote unquote, the end of the world as we know it. Ashraf Jamal is a research associate in the Visual Identities and Art and Design Research Center at the University of Johannesburg. He's a co-author of Art in South Africa, The Future Present, um, and also co-editor of India, Indian Oceanic Studies, Social, Cultural, and Political Perspectives. Ashraf Jamal is also the author of Predicaments of Culture in South Africa, Love Themes for the Wilderness, The Shades in the World, and Essays on Contemporary South African Art, as well as a new forthcoming book, Strange, Strange Cargo Essays on Art. So maybe Vusi, um, if you just kind of want to take five minutes, um, just saying hello to everyone and maybe um, introducing yourself in your own words, that would be great. Um, so I'm, I'm not getting into the work, I'm just like... Yes. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll prompt you because I think that would be quite difficult to just get into the work. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, cool. I also felt it would be unfair on the panelists, co-panelists, um, if they're not uh, here. But yes. um, yeah, cool. I mean, I, I hate, not only do I hate talking about myself, but I can't talk about myself. I struggle to, um, I think, you know, out of, um, um, I believe by a specific principle that I'm, I'm quite insignificant, you know, in the greater scheme of things, specifically the work that I'm dealing with. Um, but anyways, yeah, I'm a, a researcher and writer for a critical journal called Ediso Magazine, um, where we currently, <clears throat> um, you know, doing some work around uh, Black people's space making practices, um, interrogating architecture, space and geography. Um, Black people's relation to the built environment, to landscape, <clears throat> the kind of antagonic relationship that exists between the built environment and Black bodies. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so we've been doing that kind of work. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to do, but I'm also day-to-day -day educator um, teaching um, Black studies in a few institutions at the honor of working in Kopoleng as well. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and um, I'm also a student, contemporary arts student as well, uh, based in Cape Town. Uh, my primary medium, which I call it technology is writing. Um, <clears throat> I think of it as, as a technology um, mm. and everything all just sort of flows from that. But yeah, I think that's so long as I've spoken about myself in quite a while. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> That's perfect. So whilst we wait for Ashraf and not to kind of get into the meatiness of um, the conversation, the reason why you came to mind when I 
thought about this panel and when I thought about this topic was um, your thinking around what blackness is and how blackness is constituted. And I, I thought that that was like quite interesting. We had this conversation about um, Afro-pessimism, for example, as a lens through which to think through blackness. Um, and I just kind of wanted maybe if you could um, touch on that a little bit, like how do you actually think about what this huge thing <laughs> that is blackness, um, how it's constituted? Because obviously all of that stuff feeds into um, some of these ideas of like, how are we seeing the black image replicated, produced and circulated? Cool. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I mean, I was also just looking forward to more chats about about that. Um, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm primarily interested in, in interrogating South Africa as a plantation, that would be the shortest. Um, and and thinking about, you know, what we call social relations in this country is resembling what would be relations within a sort of plantation context. Right. Um, <clears throat> and how the sort of violent integrity of the slave master dialect finds full expression in this country, you know, mm -hmm. um, the fullest form, the fullest way. Right. Uh, and that to understand South Africa is actually to understand the world. Right. Um, and therefore, I think of the sort of world making violence of, 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 of slavery, of slaveness um, as a violence that can be divorced from the position that is blackness, right? Um, <clears throat> or rather put another way, you know, one can begin to understand blackness outside of that violence, right? It becomes a, a sort of a, if we are to employ a vehicle, a way of, of living, you know, that is saturated by this kind of violence and positioned by this kind of violence, right? Um, so as we understand and enjoy things that black people make, I'm also interested in black people as, as, as objects and subjects, as things that are being enjoyed. Right um, for the sort of psychic well-being of everyone else who's not black, you know. Uh, so I'm thinking about that kind of thing, trying to reconfigure and reconceptualize, you know, um, that slave plantex and say that it is contaminous with South Africa as we know it today, mm. you know, um, and how you know forms of living and forms of life are sort of constituted within that, or phrased differently to say that, you know, constitute the constituent elements of what South Africa is today are not so separate from what we would understand in a traditional sense, what is a slave context, mm. right? Um, so I'm interested in that kind of thing, but I'm interested in what, you know, um, um, the, you know, visual arts, you know, contemporary arts, performance, um, you know, the sort of image making technologies and what they could, you know, sort of add to that discourse. Mm. And also as a lens to understand it, interrogate it way deeper, you know, um, yeah, but I think the last time we spoke, we also talking about, you know, um, what would happen if we were to take labor outside of capitalism, right? Um, and I think, or, or take labor outside of slavery, right? What would we understand it to be? And I think it's an important work, and I think it's an important conceptual leap that allows us to understand why South Africa is a slave plantation, if we are able to take it out of that equation. Mm -hmm what labor is, yeah. I mean, here's kind of a, a question that's set to home because um, these panels and these discussions that we keep having, this is also work, right? Um, so as much as we are here because we want to be here, a lot of it is that we are performing or contributing to some kind of important labor. Well, maybe let's take important out of it, but it is labor nonetheless. So. I mean, how, how are you thinking to what these discussions mean, particularly in, in, at this point um, in history, you know, like when there is so much thinking and writing and discussion around blackness and black thought and black liberation, what does all of this mean in the context of, um, yeah, some of the ideas that you put forward? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in no way um, disavowing labor, right? Mm. Um, I don't think of it as a constituent element, right? I don't think it's an, it's, I don't think it's an essential relation, you know, um, <clears throat> mm. and which is to say that you could take it out and still have slavery, mm -hmm. you know, um, but it doesn't mean it's not there, it's not existed, I'm not denying it, right? Um, so I think it's important 
Um, and I think that certain, you know, the work that we're doing are important in such profound ways, right? Um, as important as the extraction of labor, or the extraction or exploitation of surplus value, just as important, right? Um, but what I'm arguing then is to say, we could still be black without them. You know, mm -hmm. uh, what constitutes and positions us as black, you know, labor is not at the center of that violence, uh -huh. right? Um, but it is there, you know. Uh -huh. So I, I, I hope I'm, I'm making, I'm answering your. Yes, yeah. I'm also a little bit worried. <laughs> I'm also a little bit worried that we're gonna get sucked into the whole uh, <laughs> because that's obviously a conversation that can take the entire night. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you the first provocation in relation to this topic. Um, and then we'll kind of take it from there. And I saw there is, <laughs> there is a question um, in the Q&A, which I'll go back to, but I'm worried that if I start there, it's gonna kind of take us through um, a different path. So I guess the first provocation is, having been in the art world for as long as you are, um, in the multiple roles that you kind of occupy, what would you say your relationship is with figurative work? In what instances is the figuration, abstraction, binary useful or interesting to you? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I was, I was like <clears throat> wrecking my head with this provocation. <laughs> I was thinking about that last night. Um, to a point, I was like, maybe I should just like pull out of this. <laughs> you think that's what Ashraf did? Where is he? <laughs> Yeah, you just, you gave me a thesis worth the kind of, you know, um, I also don't think we have enough time for that. Um, but I mean, I just like drafted a few notes, you know, certain thoughts that jumped when I was thinking about this, right? Mm. Um, and uh, they're quite incoherent, so please bear with me. But they're just as incoherent as, you know, the experience of being black in the world, right? Um, so there's a kind of, of, of link that at least I'm happy, you know, keeps me sane. Um, <laughs> you know, um, but um, I was thinking about, you know, my relation rather, I mean, firstly, you know, at the risk of, of sounding flippant, right? I don't have quite a deep relation with figurative work. <laughs> <laughs> to put that out of the way, um, <clears throat> you know, um, the, what, what stood out for me about the provocation is, you know, sort of challenging or getting to think about the sort of this binary between, you know, figurative and abstraction. And, you know, and, and just thinking about, you know, um, firstly, as a thing that is really, you know, how, 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 how I'm doing for time, um, what's, firstly? Um, I, we still got quite a bit of time, so I think we're fine. I'll like I'm stop. Just for this specific response. Oh, for this response, I yeah. give it, Give it a minute and a half. Yo, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I'll try and go as much as I can. Um, cool. cool. Um, so I'm thinking about what Fanon, you know, um, task us as putting the settler out of the picture, right? Um, in, in the reach of the earth. And I'm thinking of it in a very literal way, right? And I've been thinking about it in a very literal way for so long. Right. I mean he's talking about decolonization as in, you know, sort of taking settlers out of the colony, but I'm thinking of it as an art practice of putting the settler out of the picture, right? Um, but to reconfigure that and also say to put the human out of the picture, right? Because um, <clears throat> at some point the two can become, you know, uh, there's, there's a thin line that could separate the two, right? But I'm, we don't have time for that. Um, but I'm interested in what abstraction allows us, right? Um, you know, the level of visual grammar, the level of um, articulation, you know, what it allows us in putting the settler out of the picture, sort of reconfiguring and interrogating the structural logics of the world, right, which I believe would, would sort of allows quite generative and productive ways in which one could assume a sort of disruptive approach to contemporary culture, right, um, which consequently po possibly could become sort of disruptive approach to the world, right. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm also interested in in sort of figurative work, there's this desire for recognition, right? Um, that I'm really drawn to, right? One could call it the desire for representation, whatever the case may be, right? Uh, <clears throat> that I'm really drawn to, and I've been trying to like sort of, you know, break down even the word itself, but in the notes, I was just thinking about, you know, sort of the root internal to recognition being co 
cotton is that, right? To, um, uh. right? And I was just thinking about it as a, as a, as, a, as a form of abstraction of reality to a point one is reduced to empirical knowledge, right? One is legible, one can be comprehended, one could be visible, um, one could be acknowledged as known, right? Um, <clears throat> and, and secondly, one could be incorporated, right? And I think, you know, hand in hand, you know, recognition goes hand in hand with the idea of incorporation, right? One could be incorporated, whether it, you know, through a sort of visual regime or you know through political lexicon or the dominant social order right in all of those layers of abstraction um, one could be incorporated which is to mean one could be one could have one's existence acknowledged you know um valid to have been sort of validated and integrity of of existing and being um but one could be a legal subject right uh, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm 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 thinking first in the in first instance thinking about it as a thing that is opened up by abstraction and foreclosed in some way by the figurative work. But at the same time, the second instance I'm thinking about is a thing that is also just not that possible, you know. Uh, but I guess I'm also approaching it, you know, um, from sort of sort of pessimistic lens. And, and I, I don't know, I, I, I'd assume you, you stand on the opposite side of where I'm sitting. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I was thinking about as far as, you know, um, that and trying to sort of you know strip it down to its bare um, minimum of comprehension. Um, yeah. yeah, but I don't know if any of that made sense. Yeah, yeah. No, there's so much here that I want to go back to. So firstly, I love that you brought this idea of cognizance into the discussion. Uh, so thinking through cognizance as a realization, a recognition, and legibility. Um, but what's also interesting to me is that you were thinking about abstraction as a way to kind of open the ways in which people can read themselves into the image, because it doesn't have to be this particular black person drawn in this particular way, living this particular kind of life. It can be like a square and that square literally speaks to how you see yourself as a human being. But I'm also interested to challenge this though, to say, well, does figuration actually foreclose that? You know, if we've had centuries and centuries of white people literally drawing and like put, putting themselves back into the picture, what did you begin with? You began with um, taking the settler out of the picture. So this is like them literally either drawing landscapes that have nobody in them or landscapes that have white people in them. And, you know, wherever it is, it's kind of this idea of putting themselves into the narrative. So how do you kind of balance those two thoughts then, you know, thinking around um, perhaps figuration is not a foreclosure then in that mm -hmm. way, if it allows that kind of, you know, world making and like imposition almost. I'd first say, you know, um, I, I, am, I think my, my, I want to say so many things, but yeah. <laughs> um, I'd first say that human capacity and narrative, right, um, at all levels of, all, all levels of abstraction um, mm. are not available to Black people. And I, and I say that to, to, to provoke a, a, a conversation around that. Um, <clears throat> and I'm indebted, you know, to this line of work through the sort of Afro-pessimist um, canon, right? Um, that when one begins to interrogate the world and study it diachronically, right? And study the world synchronically, one can say, firstly, there's something ethical about the world in the face of black people. Secondly, one can say, um, I mean, putting aside ethics, one also can say black people seem to embody um, what Frank Wilkerson calls a narrative arc, right? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not him saying this, but, you know, <clears throat> saying that there's something about the narrative arc that is just not available to Black people, right? As, it, as a thing that sort of moves in the traditional sense from equilibrium, disequilibrium to equilibrium, right? That is, becomes sort of narrative embodied, sort of becomes a sort of narrative progression that is embodied by all subjects, but Black people, right? Um, <clears throat> So I'm thinking of that, right, as a sort of first instance. Um, and then thinking about, 
you know, could it then be possible to put the black in the picture, right? Mm. Um, Fanon seems fascinated by the possibility of putting the settler out of the picture, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's not, it doesn't mean what I'm saying here in terms of, in a sort of pictorial yeah. sense, right? Um, but let's, for, just for now, let's, let's, you know, let's, let's subvert for now, just for now. Um, he's fascinated by the idea of putting the settler out of the picture, right? Uh, or, or putting the human out of the picture, right? As, a, as humanist as Fanon is. Um, <clears throat> but I'm also saying, even if there is a possibility of a revolutionary violence or revolutionary kind of radical, um, you know, revolutionary praxis at a, at a, at a cultural expression or political uh, liberation, if there is a possibility that we embody such a revolutionary capacity so as to put the set out of the picture, within the prevailing dominant episteme, I still don't think one could put the black in the picture, right? Um, that one must abolish those categories, those racial categories, you know, um, in order to abolish the gaze, you know, in order to abolish the violence that we subjected to when people see us in our blackness, right? In the sort of Kerry James Marshall kind of darkness, right? That one even in, in the hopeful, you know, gesture of wanting to subvert it, the gaze is there looking at you, appropriating your skin, appropriating your flesh, enjoying you, right? You're being enjoyed, you know? Finger Samson's subjects and figures are enjoyed, yeah. right? Uh, within the sort of Western um, hemisphere museum and gallery space, they're enjoyed in the sort of Sadia Hartman sense of blackboard is being enjoyed, the subject of enjoyment or desire, right? Therefore, even one, you know, sort of opt optimistically wants to subvert it, it really doesn't happen, right? Um, and therefore I'm convinced then that one must take the black out of that category, that racialized category, in order for the black to occupy an ethical sort of pictorial framework. To... Uh, I don't know if that, that's making sense, but that I think is... it's, yeah. I think it's quite hopeful and wishful to think we can occupy and we seem to embody human capacity to replace the settler within the same regime, within the same paradigm, pictorially speaking. I don't think so. I mean, that is fascinating because when I came into this discussion, I kept on asking myself, that's why I started with Zadie Smith saying, well, why do we do the things that we do? I kind of was trying to find a link to explain to us why the image matters. And so in my mind, it was the idea that image making is a way towards black liberation or maybe one of the ways towards black liberation. I'm not kind of suggesting that every artist is out there <laughs> painting themselves because they wanna be liberated, but one of the things that I was thinking was that it's a critical component of that work of Black liberation. But what you seem to be suggesting is that by even just by kind of putting yourself into that um, process or into that realm, given that the conditions haven't changed, there is actually no subversion. So it's the whole idea of um, the master's tools not being able to dismantle the master's house, right? You are still in this house, just kind of using different tools. Um, but I wanna, I, I wanna push back on that because then if we take that line of thinking, then that could take us really far in the sense that how do we then get back from, um, how do black people reclaim their narrative arc um, to, how do we then determine the things that matter, right? So are, are we then kind of saying that until racial categories are completely abandoned and it's impossible for us to talk about a black figure versus a mainstream figure or the other, then whatever it is that we're doing is irrelevant. So the point that I'm trying to, to kind of ask you is, what is it that, that doesn't take this too far, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to say, um, is it really a binary? Is it a zero to one? You know, either you abolish the system and the processes and the racial categories, and therefore you can have creators creating whatever they want, or are there nuances and gaps 
and tensions and kind of um, interesting ways before we get there, if we ever get there also. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm personally not interested in, in, the, the, in the getting there, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I'm just like the skeptic. I'm a skeptic, you know. <laughs> so, so I don't know. Like I can't say I can't say putting. I must not take. Let's say that. <laughs> I can't say that. I can't say that. I can't say Zanele Mohole mustn't, you know, uh, darken mm. their skin. I I can't say that, you know. Um, <clears throat> but I'm. I guess what I'm what I'm trying to get at, you know, um, Mohole is doing. <laughs> hmm? I'm saying you can critique what Zanella Moholi is doing or like critically engage what Zanella Moholi is doing. <laughs> yeah, or maybe I could say maybe the subversion is wishful thinking, you know, um, and, and, and maybe we could entertain it, but, you know, I mean, I was reading, um, you know, researcher and, and, and critic Ati Georgia, but Ati Georgia talking, writing about, you know, um, I mean, I'm still wrestling with that piece, but like talking about, you know, Razanella's work um, and, you know, <clears throat> and, and what, what, got, what, what I was thinking about around that time was, you know, um, this idea of how that, that sort of dark, you know, um, black skin is enjoyed, you know? <laughs> um, and could that happen at the same time as the subversion of the gays, you know? Um, could it could it happen at the same time, you know? Um, and um, and I don't know if it's it's um, if it's possible, but <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I, I I don't think so. Yeah, that's super interesting. Okay, so given your pessimism about the figure, let's go into Darby English's quote then, and kind of hear what what he some of the suggestions or things that he's grappling with um, in relation to the figure. And now I'm really interested to kind of hear what you think. Um, so Darby did this interview with uh, Fola Sade for Artnet, um, and they were kind of talking around this idea of, um, as we are, the pro proliferation um, of the Black figure in art. Um, and so he says, on the one hand, the figure is a sign of life. And in a protected series of seasons of death, signs of life are utterly crucial and need to be honored absolutely. On the other hand, the proliferating figure is a clear market indicator where there's a taste for black art or blackness as art, i.e. the figure, which generates satisfying unthreatening presence um, effects and goes down easy. Everyone's having a great fucking time. So you need to be able to make distinctions between say figures of black vitality, magical commodity figures, figures that challenge the terms of their commodification and figures that do important representational work precisely because they're hard to figure out, which is how we consume culture. To me, the worrisome thing about a flood of figuration is the time and resources we aren't spending on the part of us that we can't image the parts that we want sell, the mysteries, the fractions, the freaks. So whenever I see a figure, the first thing I need to do is to determine what it is and what it's for. Is it a good witch or a bad witch? Okay, so, I mean, from your, the way you've just kind of articulated um, through the first part of this conversation, I wanna start with this question of the figure as a sign of life. Maybe if you could return to that, because I think you kind of have spoken to that a little bit in terms of like the incession and, um, you know, kind of whether it's possible to actually have such a thing as a black figure, but maybe we could start there. This idea of like the figure as a sign of life. How do you respond to that? Cool. Um... Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, um, in my earlier flippant mode, I, I guess I was trying to like dodge that one. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I was just, yeah. I mean, I, I think in in some ways, you know, we were 
we're anticipating, we're both anticipating that. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and, I'm, and I guess I'm thinking, you know, about how, how we think about, you know, the, the I, I'm trying to like collapse and think about, you know, the, not only the work being, not only the figure within the work, right, um, being a thing that is, not only is the work consumed, mm. right, and enjoyed, you know, um, but the, the, the figure itself being consumed and enjoyed, right, um, in ways that seem consistent with how we are consumed and enjoyed, mm. right, um, and that being possible because there seems to be a denial of life, right, of our life, you know, um, <clears throat> it seems to be, you know, a thing that, you know, we are sort of constantly robbed of, right, uh, so I guess, you know, I'm, I'm sort of wrestling with those kinds of tension, right, um, and, and, and again, you know, thinking about these kinds of, you know, um, these kinds of mysteries, you know, um, these, these freaks and mysteries that are ours can be represented, you know, and to push and say even those things can seem to be unsafe as well, right? Um, not only are they unsafe, you know, I don't know to what extent can they keep us safe, you know? Um, mm. And, you know, that, and then thinking about that, that, that paradox um, and the possibilities of representation and whether, you know, they're, you know, quite, it's a technology that is, could possibly keep us safe. But anyways, you know, putting that aside, um, you know, um, you know, yeah, just thinking about, I mean, I don't wanna get into like, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a complete denial of life, right? Um, and I guess this is the, the kind of dilemma that seems to, trouble, you know, um, our engagement as black people in ways that don't trouble anyone else, right? I don't think mm -hmm. anyone can sit down and be concerned about whether we have life or we don't, you know, we seem to be the only ones of, who are just wrestling with this dilemma, you know, um, and trying to find sort of proper grammar to, to think about that, right? And I've been thinking about, you know, um, a way of, of thinking about how you have the sort of, you have the Afropes um, canon that says blackness is something that is opposition to human, right? To humanness or the human category, right? Firstly, and I'm also thinking on the other side, right? That even the thing that is, that is, that is human, that is an embodiment of life, right? Um, is not the same thing, for instance, as umtu, right? Uh. Um, uh. And, you know, that, that, that umtu, you know, um, also just stands in a sort of antagonic relation to the human, right? The human as a conqueror and a kind of Adam and Eve guardianship, you know, um, as, a, as a divinely ordained overseer of everyone else, you know, um, who, whose absolute privilege in the Mbembe sense, right, um, permits them to, um, to render everyone else, you know, sort of expel everyone else out of that category. But Umtu seems to stand in opposition to that, right? Um, therefore, I'd be interested to know whether such assertions are made, the claim to life and the claim to human capacity are made because of the failure for English to articulate um, what we really mean, or they're really made because people really think that we embody human capacity. I don't know if I'm making sense here. I, I'm convinced that, that umtu is not the same thing as human, you know? Um, well, I guess I'm wrestling with it. I don't know, I don't know to say I'm convinced, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, um, around that. And, and therefore, if one were to, you know, um, if one were to assert um, a kind of humanness, even if in the legal sense, as is crudely and grossly misunderstood, um, if I were to assert the humanness, I think that humanness is not the human category, right? As an embodiment of absolute life, um, but rather as something else, you know? Yes, I mean, I maybe, in, in yeah, sort of maybe also what we need to do 
because I feel like um, there's another universe in which the figure isn't so tied to life or things that we represent aren't so tied to life. Like I feel like that, that, that universe exists. So maybe that's also what we just kind of need to clarify to say, we haven't this discussion in a universe where the figure is in fact tied to life. What I mean by that is that there's a possibility that someone could wake up and decide to paint themselves, whether they're green, black, blue, brown, whatever, and that can be enjoyed aesthetically and that will not be tied to kind of politics or history, um, economics, all of these things, right? So this world either exists in my mind, <laughs> um, which I think is valid because it means that there's a possibility that this thing could happen, but the world in which we exist today me makes that link between what we make versus what what those things mean. I feel like that I feel like that's not a stretch that there's already this strong assumption that we live in a world where the things that we make and we represent, particularly as black people, mean something. Right. So that's kind of the first um, that's the first thing I wanted to say. You'll tell me what you think about this, whether you want to push back or whether you agree. The second thing is um, I'm thinking about um, what art is for. And this is the question that I keep going back to, like, why do we have art? You know, um, and in the most kind of romantic, innocent way, art is a form of expression. You know, you have something that is interesting to you and you kind of want to depict it, whether there is what you spoke about earlier, that narrative arc, whether it's there or not, right? Um, and also there is kind of this idea of like um, art as a vector towards knowledge, a way in which we can better understand things. We can kind of deconstruct things, wrestle with them um, and move closer to, to knowledge. And so, one of the questions that I have for you is this time that's spent thinking about the work that the image is able to achieve or not. It's time that we are not spending thinking about as hot, um, as Darby says here, like stars and mysteries. Um, I was watching this documentary on Netflix um, about black holes and it just completely blew my mind. I was like, Imagine if we lived in a world where like black people had as much time to think about these insane, beautiful, crazy mysteries of the world versus like what is the best way to honor George Floyd, you know, which gets into these notions of like representing figures of life or whatnot. Um, so in a very convoluted way, <laughs> um, the question that I have for you is, what do you think these mysteries and freaks and fractions are that, that we potentially not tapping into? And then also to go back to my initial proposition that um, we are tied to figures of life meaning something as black people or, or that they matter. Okay, cool. Um, damn, I've run out of coffee. <laughs> Sorry, that was a, yeah, that was very complicated. <laughs> and I see yeah, um, we're going to come to the questions and the chats in a little bit. Um, as soon as um, Vusi is done with this response, I'll go to the questions and chats. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, there was, um, a lot. Um, firstly, I think that what you call that that universe, um, I think that universe doesn't have what we know as blackness. Mm. Um, that world where we are safe 
we aren't, we aren't black people, mm. you know? Um, it's a completely, I don't know, but it's just not this epistem, right? Where we are black, right? And um, there seems to be a conflation around, I mean, I mean, people are, you know, sort of, I mean, like, like I said earlier on, you know, I'm really, really indebted to this, this kind of sort of reformulation and, re, you know, thinking about these things through that canon of, you know, Afro pairs, but, you know, um, I'm also just like generally convinced that, you know, we aren't black in that space, you know, um, I'm, I don't want to even bother myself thinking what we are then, <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> and therefore then it gets us to think about um, why do we make art, but also what could art afford, mm. right? Um, and, you know, um, and I think sometimes, you know, generally mock some of my artist friends about the sort of overvaluation of what art could do. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and the sort of possibilities. And I speak about this as an art practitioner myself. I also make art, you know, so I'm not speaking as an outsider, just simply write. I'm, yeah, writing about art is a form of art, but anyway, that's what I meant. Um, but I also speak myself as someone who also makes art. Um, and sometimes I, I think about, you know, this, like I said, it's a sort of overvaluation of, of what it makes possible. Um, <clears throat> rather than as a thing that um, sort of crystallizes black energy, you know, um, as a thing that makes black rage, you know, I mean, I'm not to say aestheticize black rage, but you know, um, that makes black rage um, legible. Um, and I guess you, as your, your stretch and your leap is to say it contributes towards knowledge production, right? Uh, and I guess, you know, uh, in, 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 in a way of, you know, sort of formulating black rage, you know, um, and, and, you know, yeah, I mean, black desires, I mean, we, we desire that world, you know, we all do. So no one should be condemned for desiring it, you know. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm then thinking about how then, um, I mean, yeah, putting aside also that, you know, this, this overvaluation, right? Um, but thinking about as a thing that could stand, you know, as a, as a thing that, like I said, crystallizes our rage, right? Um, and in our mapping of what we, sh we could do, right? It becomes an accompaniment to those projects, right? Um, and in our fashioning and refashioning of ourselves and our personhoods or our subjectivities, if that is even possible, it becomes central in that project. Right, um, you know, but I don't know if it's going to, to sort of Sandra us to another planet. <laughs> you know? I I don't I don't know, you know. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, if we that's... imagine it first. I, if, if we can't imagine it, it's definitely not happening. Mm -hmm. If we imagine it, it might happen just because we've imagined it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? My point is that for things to happen, they do begin with kind of, yeah, all we're doing at the end of the day is like world making, right? And world making begins with the ability to think of something. And I, I think that's really powerful that um, even though something is impossible, the ability to kind of create that's why art is so special like the ability to kind of create it out of nothing or to think it um is so powerful i mean i was i'm oh, sorry were, were you mm. okay cool i mean i was i've been revisiting unati slasha's jahil's um um unati slasha is a is an author from dispatch um <clears throat> and um and I mean, I, I, I felt, I mean I, re, I mean, I read this book when it came out and revisited it last year um, because I, was, I wanted to respond to it critically, right? Um, and then I did, and then the work was out and I realized that, fuck, I wanted to say more, you know? <laughs> uh, so I've, I've been going back to it, but anyways, so those weren't aware of Jahil's, um, this story of a, Hossa initiate a, you know, 
a twekula. I don't really know what a twekula would be in English. Someone, please, in the chat, please. Assist. But <laughs> we are we are twekula, right? And goes into a world that Slasher described as bakupa, right? Um, what in the sort of normal sense would be where witches just roam amok and you know, um, you know. But there's so much death in there. But I was so fascinated with the construction of bakupa. Right, in a sort of basic architectural sense, right, in a sort of geographical and landscape, you know, not necessarily in the political order and distribution of violence and distribution of desires and enjoyment of Lomqueta, this boy, but the actual physical environment of Bakup, right? Um, and those who've, who've read Bakupa would, would, would tell you about how Slasha sort of construct this world that is has walls that are built on flesh that has, you know, dripping things and landscape <laughs> made of skulls. And, you know, um, he constructs a world through bodies, right? Bodies are central to that. So much so that even the sort of atmospheric um, um, kind of noise that you would imagine as a, you know, um, you know, what would they be wind and, and you know, the sky and, you know, even those um, are personified, right? They, they, they become, I don't, I don't know if the person is the right category here to employ, but like they, they speak and scream, they do things, mm. right? And what happens is this figure, um, Jahils, this Ikosa initiate, seems in his movement, right? He seems to not only animate response from the wall, in the hills, in the landscape, in the sky, but seems to antagonize them to a point that they want to take part of his flesh, right? They want to eat him up and consume it and appropriate him, right? They build, they want to build things out of him, mm. right? Um, and therefore, it got me thinking about how we could trouble the idea of Black people's capacity for world making, that it seems as if the world is, is made from us, you know, like, like the con we seem to live in a world that is constructed through us, right? That's what for me the book was saying, right? And I, I mean, I was like, I, I, I just shut down. I didn't care about dialogue. I didn't care about anything else. I just like page through that thing and going through and checking that out, you know, um, in very like profound and brilliant ways, you know. Um, that I mean, of course, sort of. I mean, if you if you if you've read Amos Tutola's work as well. You know, um, he sort of does that thing, right? A uh, Nigerian novelist, um, he does that thing where he constructs, you know, but I don't think he does it in the way that Slasher employs the body central to that world making, you know, um, capacity, right? And so for me, world making seems to be, you know, the way in which the world, what we would call as modernity, right? You know, seem to be made from that. And Slasher does that thing so brilliant and visceral way, you know, um, that I've just like been sleeping with that book, because I'm like, you know, <laughs> and it, it just didn't read the same as I read it like three or so years ago, you know. Um, and, and with the work that I've been doing on black geography, which is also an oxymoron, right? Like, you know, like what the fuck is black geography, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah. But the work I've been trying to do on black geography through Indie So magazine was like, you know, to think about that thing, right? The world making practices and capacity to build, right? The built environment um, and, and its relation to modernity or modernity as, or that as a precondition of possibility for modernity, right? Yeah. And, and where then do we begin to situate black people in that kind of violence? Uh -huh. right? um, and how people theorize around, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a very illiterate on, on, on architecture and the discipline itself, right? Um, but I've just been like having chats with people around that, right? And thinking about, you know, um, there's an idea that certain architectural, you know, buildings or formations alienate people. And, you know, uh, and, and I've, I've, may, I've been trying to make that leap to jump beyond that, you know, um, to say maybe they don't just alienate us, they antagonize us, they violate uh -huh. us, you know. Um, but yeah. yeah, yeah, hope that makes sense. 
I mean, I have so many questions in relation to that, but I won't be selfish. I'll, I'll just open it up because I think we've got some um, nice comments. Um, but I was just going to say, I was going to say the skin as currency, but it kind of feels like it's going beyond that. It's this consumption or consumption doesn't even begin to explain what you're talking about that it encapsulates the way in which our bodies are used and kind of yeah anyway uh so in the q a uh sorry if i say your name wrong R ronwin baker um so ronwin is asking could you elaborate on the antagonistic relationship with the built environment which is kind of what you touched on a little bit now um, I mean, I don't know if I can say more on that, but, uh, you know, I mean, <clears throat> the, that antagonistic relationship to architecture in the built environment was sparked by Unati Slasher's work um, in that kind of way. And, um, and yeah, I mean, firstly, I felt like, you know, I, I didn't really do it much justice in terms of like the thing that I'd written. Um, but the idea was, you know, was just basically what I was talking about, right? That this, what we, we seem to be dealing with, you know, the built environment is not some passive um, kind of object that stands there and not allowing us in. It seems to be proactively, you know, um, mm. doing these things to us. There's no passivity to it. You mm. know? Um, and, you know, there's a kind of, there's a life, that it has on its own, you know? Um, and and when, when one speak about, you know, apartheid spatial planning, uh, sort of geographic layout and urban planning, you know, um, as a thing that has outlived apartheid, what we are not saying really is what I've just said, right? <laughs> you know, that not only is this architecture just outlived apartheid, but it has proactively wanted to outlive apartheid yeah. and has proactively wanted to consume black bodies. You know, um, we, we, we can't stress enough how township architecture continues to kill black people. You know, um, mm -hmm. how in Kylie Charge, shacks just ban and, and just it's, it's a crisis. You know, um, how the, the roads, the sort of, you know, urban planning itself, you know, um, those models aren't just passive, there's a kind of proactive form of violence and terror that is enacted every single day. You know, um, I've lived it my whole life, I know it, right? So, you know, um, but I guess, yeah, that's what I was, how my response was. Yeah, I mean, maybe one of the things we didn't uh, talk about in this discussion is the fact that the consumption of the black bodies through the image is also not passive. Right, you have whole organizations and structures that are literally like drawing this kind of imagery, which is what's interesting to me. Like, if you think about the thirst and the hunger of like museums and galleries for this kind of image, it tells a really kind of perverse story. So, there is also this like active consumption as opposed to like, oh, okay, it's in front of my face, so I'll just consume it. Um, speaking to your last point, Crazy, um, can you can you see the, the chats? I don't want to mispronounce because I don't speak is it closer? Can you see the chat? I mean, I, I, I realize that there's a what you read I I, I couldn't see, but I can see oh. Is the coolest one. So uh, this one is in this one is in the chat. So maybe if you could read oh, that. Oh yeah. So I yeah, Kwezi Kule says, um, I think if Uku Twechulwa um provided is the same as it is in Sizulu, is to steal someone's soul in order to enslave them or to be zombified or the undead. Um yeah, yeah, yeah. That would that's the sort of same use in which it is deployed within the yeah sort of narrative strategy within um unati slashes jahil's um so yeah thank you um crazy for that yeah no I, I completely totally agree okay uh we also have a comment here from fari 
She says, that was an excellent question, Nkopleng. It seems as though what Black liberation is calling for is not necessarily the abolition of the category of Blackness, because we enjoy it. Can they keep us safe and the possibilities of representation is such a useful lens through which to view Black figures, especially since the figures are often responding to erasure and other forms of violence. I think the question of what art is for is dependent on who you ask. For parents of small children, it's a fun activity. For artists, maybe it's a compulsion, a necessity, an expression, or a vocation. So I liked what Darby English had to say about figuring out what it is and who it is for. Yeah, there's so much in there. I don't know if you want to respond. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm. I'd be interested in a clarification regarding the, the line because we enjoy it. Mm. Uh, what? I'm, I I'm wonder if it's possible to enjoy, get permissions. Yeah. yeah. I'm not very well versed in Zoom, but I thought it would be possible to kind of give someone permission to speak. Do you know how to do that? Yeah. Mm. Give me two yeah. sec. So we're looking to uh, give Fari permission. Yes. Uh, just so she can kind of, or, and also anyone else, we have a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. If you want to ask your question, um, this would be a time Sarah can give you space. Sorry, um, if you can unmute yourself, you are able to, to respond to that question that Lucy has about your comment. Sure, I don't know, can you hear me? Mm. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for this wonderfully rich conversation. I'm learning so much just listening to the different points of view. And I hope that the books that you mentioned, you'll drop those titles in the chat. Um, but I was thinking, um, you can probably hear from my accent that I am a Black American. And so I was thinking about the idea of abolishing the category of Blackness and how for myself and for many others, in the US and I don't know whether or not you feel like this is applicable in your particular context, that there is a sense of joy and pride in being black. There is um, not just a negative experience of blackness, but something that feels welcoming, something that feels inclusive, something that feels like a club that I am a part of, not just in this country, but in terms of being part of a larger diaspora as well. So that's what I was mostly speaking to with the, with the idea that, you know, Blackness is not just something that causes pain. It's not just an experience of suffering, but also one that, you know, includes joy and celebration and love and family and kinship and the richness of culture and, and ancestral traditions. Mm. Thanks for that. I think we had this discussion, Lucy, when, um, when I was saying one of my big problems with Afro-pessimism is particularly the starting point. Um, are you still there? I can't see Lucy. Uh, he is still there. I think he's on mute. We'll see. I can see you. Oh, he's I can... muted. Yeah. So kind of accounting for black joy and beauty um, within an effort piece. Yeah. How do you respond? Um, I mean, I'd I first say, um, I don't yeah, I mean, I always hate this thing because you almost appear as a as a killjoy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but um, I mean, firstly, you know, um, I'm going to just try and talk about in my, you know, as far as I I I've been thinking about it. Um, I'm I'm in no way, I don't think I could. I you know, I'm I'm in no way. Yeah, I don't think I would identify as a, I mean, I don't say I, want to, I don't identify as an Afro person, but that's not your question. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, I'll just try and, you know, um, respond as far as I, I understand um, the relation between that. Um, 
I I I love seeing people having fun. I love I love joy. I love seeing people playing, living, you know, um, spaces to to be safe and free, and you know, um, well, not safe, but like you know, to be able to and to to experience these profound feelings and moments and experiences, right? Um, and I'm in no way trying to deny that. And I don't think in any way I've picked up within the Afropest canon a denial of that, you know. Um, but yeah, that's not what you're asking. But what Fari is asking as well. <clears throat> And I would, I would guess in, in very short, I think this, yeah, this would require a bit more time, but in short, um, because I'm not in denial of that, right? Um, I, I'm convinced then that those feelings of profound feelings of joys, uh, profound feelings and experiences of joy, right? Um, I experienced within the context of that violin. You know, mm -hmm. um, the experience within the context of answer, not that they are not experienced, right? Mm -hmm. um, it is in no way keeping you safe from bullets. It is in no way in Kailicha keeping you safe from a shack fire that could kill you just for being there. Or some random gun, you know, bloodthirsty, gun totting cat could just randomly kill you because you look like someone else in the hood. Or a bullet you know, from a police officer, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, so it seems as if then we, I'm taking to mean that, you know, there isn't such, of course there is, you know, um, but it, 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 no one could say, and like I said earlier, no one could study the world, no one, even in a brief study of the world in a sort of diachronic and synchronic way, one would be able to say, Black people have enjoyed joy outside of that context, you know, um, outside of the grip and the violence of what being Black means, right? Um, <clears throat> so I don't know, it seems as if sometimes there is a conflation of the two. Uh, and I think one could understand that joy, one could understand also the, the other side of that coin, right, that violence, without the one collapsing the other in some way. I don't know if that's, yeah. Um, but I think language is failing me here, but it, 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 no one could say that it can be enjoyed outside of that, you know. Um, mm. And I think art practice functions somewhat in a similar way, right? Um, no artist, you know, um, is safe from the taint of race, you know, in the same way that no artist then becomes safe from violence, right, from terror, you know, um, from what you possibly could be open to and vulnerable to in this country, in Cape Town, if someone was based in Cape Town. Mm, mm. I'm in yeah. art, but I'm also not safe from my classmates, <laughs> you know, who are white. I am not safe from my lecturers who are white. I am not safe from, <clears throat> you know, um, from black security officers outside the building, you know. Um, mm. But at the same time, I, I love the shit that I'm doing with the studio, you know? Um, I guess, it, it, yeah. yeah, I guess it's what Martin speaks about that you have to think about the terror and the beauty in the same, in the same line, right? But um, I'm also conscious of time because I think that this discussion has been so enriching and so powerful. The worst thing to do, <laughs> would be to waste all of that by uh, adding extra minutes that don't need to. I think there's so much um, that we all need to go back and think about. Like, I'm still grappling with this notion of like, um, create Black people's inability, something about Black people and narrative arc and the impossibility of the two. I'm still, you said something like that and I'm still kind of trying to reconcile that. Um, and your thoughts on abstraction as well. I'm still kind of trying to digest, but- um, I'm, I'm losing you there, Hopolin. Oh, really? Sorry. Um, the point that I was trying to make is that um, I think that we should come to a close just because the conversation has been so rich. But before we do that, I wanted to give anyone an opportunity out there if you kind of want to, either ask a question, reflect, whatever. Um, so if you wanna raise your hand, now is the time. Um, otherwise, I think it would be really great to kind of um, 
yeah. Apologies for interrupting and hobbling, but there is a, a question by Ati. Um, Ati, ah, okay. would you uh, like to take the floor and um, voice your question yourself? Ati, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but you're on mute. No, I asked, I asked the question. I put a... Do you want to just say it out loud for us and then the panelists can respond to you directly? Oh, uh, no, I don't. I don't want to. It's just <laughs> read it. It's there. Okay, fine. <laughs> All right. All Thanks. right. Um, Ati, <laughs> Fussy, uh, what does it mean to abolish or doing away with blackness as opposed to affirming it in a world that already assumes yeah. blackness as a questionable presence? Thanks for bringing in yeah. Slasha. Oh, Vossi, you're muted. Oh. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, my, my mic was off. Uh, <clears throat> cool. I mean, I think what I would, how I would respond to that is also, you know, embedded in that question as well, right? Um, that, you know, um, that the fact that blackness is a sort of questionable presence, um, one would say, you know, sort of ontological absence, you know, is, I believe, reason enough to want to do away with this racial category that is black. But I'm, I'm saying that because, you know, I've, I've been, thinking about and really like, you know, um, wrestling. I mean, in my thinking about reconceptualization of um, the human as opposed to umdu, right? I've been thinking about this idea, right? Um, and, and thinking about, you know, the human not being available to, um, to us, right? And, um, <clears throat> and therefore, because of you know, and in, in the fact that it's it's the the well the fact that human capacity is not available to us, right? Um, which is to say, the fact that we occupy a questionable presence um, is because of you know blackness can't be pulled apart, right? Um, from that violence that founded it in the first place, right? Um, I'm I've I've been convinced then that there was a point where Black people did not know themselves as black, you know. Um, and if one is interested in that point, one have to go to prior to the moment in which we're to negotiate with captivity, right? Um, and I think ever since we've had to negotiate with captivity, you know, it has become difficult then for us to locate ourselves outside of that category, right? Um, and therefore, since ever since every black person south of the Sahara has had to negotiate with captivity, you know. Um, then to, up, to, to, to abolish then blackness would be to live in a space where one doesn't have to negotiate with captivity, you know. Um, and yeah, I don't know if that's enough for Budati. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so my alternate universe wasn't so crazy after all. It kind of feels like that that's what we're trying to do we're trying to get to this other world where blackness is blackness doesn't exist or isn't constituted in the ways that we're thinking about it right now or maybe there maybe, isn't blackness maybe, that's what i'm trying to get to, you know? <laughs> <laughs> maybe this is where the umdu is just like a know. unit of abantu yeah i don't know how to be quoted <laughs> as having said Post blackness <laughs> is going to please, please. <laughs> yeah, I get I get quite confused with it because I thought that um, but this is a discussion for another day. Like, what is bro broader? Like, is is umtu broader than like human? You know, if you were to draw a circle, what would be inside what? I think that's a that's an interesting conversation between human and umdu, but we can have that another day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was, I was recently, just shortly, I was recently um, watching Raul Peck's Exterminate All the Brutes, um, uh -huh. four-part series 
on HBO, Ralph Peck is a Haitian um, filmmaker. <clears throat> and, you know, he, he talks about sort of privilege as a form of embodying the world, right? Um, as uh. to embody it as, as absolute privilege, right? Um, and therefore I was thinking about, you know, oh fuck, we don't embody the world, you know? That was my first thing, you know? Even though he didn't say that, he didn't push it that way, you know? Um, the kind of humanism weaved in the narrative of exterminate the brute, right? Um, if anyone is interested, they could check it out, you know, I mean, and, and contest my findings. But there's a part there, I think it's, it's episode two, it's like a four part series, episode two, where it talks about embodying the world, you know? Um, and, and therefore, you know, um, and then I, before I began thinking about then, you know, umd was a thing that could, umd was a thing that, that exists within the paradigm of the human, you know? Um, it's not, like I said, it's not some Sanra expedition to elsewhere. It exists yeah. within, I mean, not to throw a jab on Sanra here, <laughs> but like it exists within that paradigm. It, it's not an, an experience or, you know, as a, yeah, you get this a lot in South African contemporary art around the, an alternative reality, and you know, it's like, <laughs> no, that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know, um, so I wouldn't locate it outside of that. You know, um, I'd locate it mm. inside of that paradigm. You know, um, that too is a possibly a cosmology that is not safe at all. You know, um, mm. but it's in there. You know? Yeah. That is fascinating. <laughs> I've had such a great time chatting to you and I feel so privileged <laughs> uh, to use that word, but I'm really happy that we got to talk about this. Um, more than anything, it's just kind of complicated the question even further, which I think is, is useful, you know, um, it's super generative. And I guess I also just want to thank um, everyone who actually made the time to come through um, and engage and listen. Um, I really do appreciate your being here and spending time. Um, Sarah as well, thank you so much for being in the background and kind of um, helping us along and kind of with the Meta Foundation as well, hosting us, um, that's greatly appreciated. And we see, I look forward to many more discussions about you know, blackness and Afropace and alternate universes or the alternate to alternate universes. Um, I don't know if you have any final words to say. Yeah, um, yeah. this is probably my my last panel discussion for the year. I've, I've exhausted <laughs> all panel discussion social bundles. Um. <laughs> do you remember? <laughs> like, why are we here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really at a, at a point of, of learning about these ideas. Um, and I felt, you know, I was not, not so certain, but at least, con you know, sort of feeling like I could be in a space to talk about them, you know? Um, <clears throat> and so I was like, I'm not, yeah. But anyways, I was like thinking about what would it mean, um, what would it mean for black cultural practice, right? Um, that doesn't concern itself with alternative realities, right? Um, but what would it mean for black cultural practice that crystallizes black rage, <laughs> formulates it um, uh -huh. and, and sits at the center of it, right? And what would black rage look like? you know, um, and, and it seems as if, you know, even in the, the, the tiniest moments of black rage, right? You know, I, I mean, I wouldn't say what we're involved in, in FMF and RMF was what black rage is possible, you know, what, uh. what it could do, it, it falls short, you know, we have a slight indication if you're looking in Haiti, we have a slight indication of what this thing could look like. Uh. You know, and you know what happened to Haiti after they did it, 
you know. Um, so we know what the world does when black rage is so absolute. Yeah. Um, and how does it become, get to that level, become that absolute? And what would I do as, a, as an artist, right, as a visual artist? What would my practice, what would be my relationship to that kind of historical movement? You know, um, and how do we then begin to use a practice sort of, you know, um, I don't know, to create another Haitian movement, that's <laughs> what I'm you know, um, but if, if I'm going to think about any future, I'm going to think about what are they going to do to us if we produce another Haitian movement, you know, we know what, high, what France did for 100 years, you know, um, after 1804. You know, um, and it seems like no one is, you know, ready to deal with that. Even black people, they're not ready to deal with that. With that, uh -huh. you know, what would it look like? What would it do? What would it mean for all of the two thousand plus service delivery protests that take place in this country pre-COVID, if they were to spread like a wildfire? Uh, and where would art practice sit and be located in that, in that thing? You know, that's what I'm personally interested in as far as my uh, research and reading and art practice is concerned. You know, um, if anyone else wants to interrogate anything else regarding Black people and Blackness, they're welcome to do so, but that's where I sit. Um, but yeah, thank you for this. Um, I see some familiar faces in the chat. Um, so thank you for everyone that came through. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's it. That's all for me. Thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. Oh yeah, thanks to Fari for the Exterminate the Brood review. I've been avoiding reviews of that film for quite a bit. Um, yeah. <laughs> Where do we find it, by the way? Hmm? Where do we find it? Also, if I just randomly drop off, I'm not being rude. It means yeah. my power yeah. is us. <laughs> Um, at, yeah, I, I actually I'm sorry. It from, from a colleague, so I don't know where you, I think, but it's on HBO. I don't know how to illegally get it. Um, okay. But yeah, I think it's worth, it's worth checking out. But I haven't read any review intentionally. Um, but thanks for that. I'll pack it, bookmark it. Mm. Yeah, it'd be also really great to kind of hear people's thoughts outside of this, you know. Um, I think one of the great things about spaces like this is if they spark something else so either it's like friendship or conversations or you know that this is not the thing itself it's kind of like a an introduction to to more hopefully um that's how i feel i also Thank wish you. my lighting was better <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> Just to add to your point in Khopaleng, I think, you know, like this project is reasonably big and this is only one discussion. It's a big topic we've undertaken. And um, I guess I would encourage anyone who is really interested in delving a bit deeper and, and getting more insight in this way to participate as fully as they can and reach out and kind of be part of the discussions. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a lovely evening. Keep warm. Yeah. All right.